strong currents in this life water shaping stones and shaping minds moving our sun I was muted. Sorry about that. Hello, everyone. Um, Miigwech for joining us tonight. My name is Jessica, and I am part of the group that's representing Durham Libraries. I would like to start tonight by reflecting upon uh, the land where we are situated on. Durham Region is situated on the land of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. As a settler, it is an honor to be able to live and learn on these lands. These lands are covered under the Williams Treaties and the traditional territory of the Mississauga, a branch of the great Anishinaabe nation, including Algonquin, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatome. These lands are still home to these amazing people who continue to care for Turtle Island, not just for themselves, but for all of us who live here currently. That includes individuals who are brought here, immigrants and settlers. So we are on session three of our four part series. We've been able to learn so much about 
um, what is going on currently. We have been able to learn from advocates, um, knowledge, language, and water keepers. And we're going to be able to continue to learn with the two remaining sessions. But really important that we continue to learn outside of these sessions. Pay attention to what our community is telling us, what's happening in the media, in the news. Um, so continue that learning outside of these sessions as well. Um, Miigwech, thank you. And we are going to be going on to a moment of silence. Um, I'm just going to bring that up. Um, so taking the time to, again, think about learning from the news. Um, I'm sure we are all very much aware of the situation that is happening with the residential schools, um, looking at all of the children whose bodies are continuously being uncovered and how many schools are still left to be investigated. So please keep the energy up to support our community uh, while they're mourning, while they're grieving throughout this process. And if we could just take a moment to honor and reflect upon those children um, before we get started tonight. Miigwech, everyone. Anin Bojo, Jill Indijnika, Skugog Minising Dunjwa. I work at Ontario Tech University as the Indigenous Cultural Advisor, and it's my pleasure to do the opening and be the moderator for tonight's session. As some of you are aware, this is a wonderful collaboration between the Durham Region Public Libraries, Durham College, and Ontario Tech University and this is our third of four panel sessions we are hosting. I hope you have all enjoyed the session so far and tonight's will no doubt be another great session. As Julie Pigeon pointed out so eloquently at the beginning of the last session, our hope is that these sessions will not only bring awareness to the community, but will raise the consciousness of non-Indigenous people who wish to help in a concrete way in more ways than liking or sharing a Facebook post, but to really take action and stand with Indigenous people of Durham Region. <clears throat> Write those letters, join protests, stop racism in its tracks by speaking out when you hear racist comments. Donate to Indigenous organizations and communities who are in need. Contact an Indigenous organization to find out how you can assist them. It's time for all of us to work together in unity. We need all of you to stand with us. So I would like to turn things over now to our esteemed panelists. But first I wanted to share that there will be an opportunity for questions after all the chiefs have spoken. Just type them in the Q&A and I will be monitoring the questions. Tonight, we have the newly elected Anishinaabek Nation Grand Council Chief, Reginald Niganabi, Niganab, sorry, Niganab. I practiced that so many times. <laughs> uh, we have the Chief of the Mississaugas of Skugog Island First Nation, Chief Kali Laraka, the Chief of Alderville First Nation, Chief Dave Mowat, and the Chief of the Mississaugas of Curve Lake First Nation, Chief Emily Wheatong. Wow, that's quite a lineup. So without taking any more time away from our guests, we will start an opening talk by Chief Reginald Niganob. The Anishinaabek Nation represents 39 First Nations across Ontario, 
including all our local First Nations. Chief Reg serves as the Chief of the Mississauga First Nation. He served on the elected council since 2009 and was elected chief in 2011. The chief has been a strong advocate for retaining our history and preservation of our traditional territories. He has strong ties to the community through his family and many relations and continues to be an advocate for youth and support their knowledge around governance, treaties, and the history of our territories. The chief also serves as the chair of the North Shore Tribal Council, a member of the Chief's Committee on Governance, Union of, Ontario's, uh, Union of Ontario Indians, and the Robinson Huron Treaty. Reg lives with his wife, Suzanne, and their two children, Harry and Genevieve. Chief Niganob, it is an honor to have you with us. Miigwech and take it away. Uh, thank you for that opening, uh, great opening. Uh, I hope uh, it's not too busy in the background. There is a lawnmower going in the background. My, my neighbor's uh, cutting their grass, so <laughs> I'm thankful for that. Um, of course, because a little bit of knowledge is that uh, um, ticks don't like the short grass, so it's good to cut your lawn. If there's a good reason to mow your lawn, that's one of them. But anyways, uh, so I am uh, happy to uh, be here tonight, and thank you for the opening. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for everybody watching at home. I'm glad that you're all with us tonight um, or wherever you might be. Um, I guess uh, what they would like to talk about, of course, is resilience. And I do have a, a little bit of a presentation that I'd like to share if I can share screen. It's mostly for, it's a very uh, straightforward presentation, but it's mostly for myself so that I can follow my speaking notes as we go along. Uh, and also give you a little bit of a history of the area and of the Mississauga Nation itself. Um, of course, you see that I'm the Anishinaabek Nation Grand Council Chief now. Uh, I am still Chief of my community, uh, but according to how busy it gets as the Anishinaabek Nation Grand Council Chief, I may actually leave my uh, step down from my community position at some point. Uh, and right now, of course, like she said, the Anishinaabek Nation does serve the 39 First Nations of the Anishinaabek Nation. Uh, there are more members of the Anishinaabek Nation, but we don't all sit within this political organization. So with that being said, I'll go on from there. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'll start screen sharing or look to screen share. Does it seem possible from here? Can any of our tech people help um, help Reginald? Hey, Reg, Liz Morris yes. from CCSI here. Your tech support team. I uh, did give you co-host permission there. So if you pull up the bottom banner for the Zoom chat, you should see the screen share just in the center there. Yep. Awesome. When we bring that up, you're going to want to select the window. And if you have any audio, just make sure we click share sound in the corner and you should be okay to go from there. It doesn't seem to want to let me. Maybe it's my own computer that's blocking it. It says open system preferences. Okay, so it might just have you accept the system preferences to allow that screen share. So just go ahead and go into that panel really quickly and uh, just see if that gives you that option there. It does, but I'm not able to utilize it. Am I able to uh, quickly share it with you real quickly? Absolutely. If you send that way. into the chat for me, I will download it and get that shared for you ASAP. Excellent. Thank you. There we go. Sorry about that, folks.
Sorry, Red. I'm just not seeing it. Um, did you pop um, that? Do you in want the me to share? It should be open on my end. Jess, if you could take over that, that would be fabulous. Perfect. So just give me a cue when you would like the slide to progress if sure. I am not doing it appropriately. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Perfect. All right, so of course we have resilience in the Mississauga Nation, and of the Mississauga Nation, we have actually six members of the Mississauga Nation, of course, as you had mentioned, there's Scugog, uh, there is also Hiawatha, Alderville, Curve Lake, Mississauga number eight, which is where I'm from, uh, and there's a reason it's number eight, and that has in relation to do with the robinson Huron Treaty, uh, and also Mississaugas of the Credit. We can move on. So of course, resilience, we all know what that means, the power or ability of material to return to its original form, position, uh, ability of a person to adjust or recover readily from illness, adversity, major life changes, uh, and ability of a system organization to respond or recover readily from a crisis or disruptive process. As I'm about to demonstrate here within this uh, discussion and within my slides, you'll see that there are, uh, the Mississauga Nation hits all three of these in some regard or some aspect so we can go forward uh, of course this is the symbol of the mississauga nation prior to contact and colonization uh, anywhere you see this symbol this is the symbol that you would recognize as the mississaugas uh, of course this you might find this on pictographs or petroglyphs or anything along uh, this great uh, area along the canadian shield um, yeah, but this is basically the, the Mississauga symbol before the Mississauga. This is the uh, Thunderbird, of course. We can go on. As you get into the territory of the Mississauga, this is the green area there is the territory that you're looking at for the Mississaugas. Um, now, this one kind of changes here and there, and it kind of fluctuates. Of course, you would have the Mississauga Nation, and uh, much discussion goes into this, is that it might have been located more towards Sault Ste. Marie, kind of where I am now. As you see, uh, Sault Ste. Marie in that blue area is called Manitoulin Island on the far top left side that says Ottawa on it. That's called Manitoulin Island. Uh, I am just north on a little on the mainland there, uh, halfway between Sault Ste. Marie and Sudbury. So within that area, that's where the Mississauga River is actually located. Uh, Mississauga or Meswezaging means a river of many outlets or many mouths. Uh, so that's a location of where we are at or where I'm at currently. Uh, the Mississauga Nation, of course, kind of, as we say, originates there. Um, of course, there is the Anishinaabe migration story. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are fully aware of that, but that's another story for another day because it is an incredibly long story and part of our long storied history around the Great Lakes and along the shores of uh, North America. But anyhow, oh, keep going back. Can we go back to the other slide? Thank you. So at that point there, up in by Sault Ste. Marie, that is where the Mississaugas resided. That's where the Mississaugas became who they are in terms of culture, language, and customs. Uh, as we, but as time progressed on, uh, and as I said in the, Mrs., uh, the Anishinaabe uh, migration story, we did start in Southern Ontario and we moved up to the north and Northern area along with the rest of the Anishinaabe. Once we were within that area, of course, we uh, had resided there for a couple of hundreds or a couple of thousand years, uh, but there was pressure from another group to our South uh, who are on the other side of that Lake Erie, Lake Ontario area, uh, known as the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee. Uh, they were pressuring up into our area. So of course there was a, a skirmish and uh, the Mississaugas ended up coming back down Southern from that area, along with the rest of our brothers and sisters, the Ojibwe and the Algonquins, uh, returning to Southern Ontario and reclaiming Southern Ontario for ourselves. And of course, that's how you get the six Mississauga nations uh, in the Southern Ontario area. Of course, they were more widespread from Kingston down to um, 
Niagara Falls or Fort Niagara around that area. Um, but in, as of course, we will get to at some point uh, where European uh, civilization uh, starts uh, coming into our area, it starts limiting our, our span of uh, territory. So we can go on. Of course, that is accomplished through the Indian Act and through of 1876 and through um, farming practices and pressure from farmers in southern Ontario to kind of isolate the Aboriginal communities to certain areas. Um, of course, that means the first uh, reserves and the reserve system, uh, which of course also forces the imposition of band council leadership away from our more hereditary forms of leadership. Uh, which is our clan system and the seven different clans that compromise that governance. Um, we could go into how that all operates too, but that's another story and another presentation for another day. Uh, of course, that leads to the division of First Nations because we're forced to remain on First Nations. So the Mississaugas actually don't get to see each other that often after that, uh, especially for my community that is so far north along the north shore of Lake Huron. We don't have many interactions with the Southern Mississauga as much after that time. Uh, of course, the whole Indian Act leads to the loss of culture, the loss of identity, the loss of our history. Uh, we would lose, you know, um, you know, our identity to through the Indian Act and it's deciding who is a status Indian and who is not a status Indian. I'm not sure if you guys have covered that, but it, I'm sure in your history lesson somewhere, you might've come across it at some point talking about status, or you might've seen legal decisions or changes to the Indian Act that allow for uh, the creation of more status Indians. Uh, it, it doesn't happen often, and it doesn't happen without much effort uh, and much hardship to go through it. Of course, loss of identity uh, through the imposition of the residential schools as we're seeing now. The residential schools meant to take away uh, the Indian, take the Indian out of the child, uh, which is what they did. So that was a loss of identity. Uh, and it is a loss of culture, of course. Um, and of course, a loss of history. Although we'll get into how that's not really lost. So we can go on. So in the present day, like I said, all is not lost. This is actually the Mississauga Nation starting to come back together. Uh, on my, there's myself on the left over there. And then next to me uh, at the time, this is uh, Alderville's chief, uh, Jim Bob Marsden. Of course, now it's Dave Mowat. There we have Chief Kelly LaRocca from Scugog. We have uh, uh, Chief Phyllis uh, Williams from uh, uh, Curve Lake. We have Chief Stacy LaForm from what was at the time was, Mrs. was New Credit, but now they are just Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, and of course, that is uh, Chief Greg Cowie on the end, who is now replaced by uh, Chief Lori Carr in Hiawatha. So that's all the six Mississauga nations starting to come back together. And this is around, I want to say 2014, 2015, when the Mississaugas actually started returning back together again and actually forming as a nation. Uh, since that time, of course, we've come back to our language and starting to revitalize our language because a lot of our language, although it seemed to be lost, and I hate to use that term, it was lost. Uh, it, it was never gone fully. There are several speakers. We've been able to interact with those speakers and revitalize our language, um, just kind of reintroducing it to our people in some ways. And of course, we have our customs. Uh, and then we started sharing our history um, as a Mississauga nations uh, and sharing this history that I just shared to you uh, just previously. And so, of course, we are reconnected. We can go on. Um, and of course, the Mississauga Nation at that time signed the Relationship Accord on October 29th, 2016, reaffirming that we would come back together, share our language, share our history, uh, share our customs, share our traditions, and perhaps reform our nation uh, within the Anishinaabek Nation, because there is the Anishinaabek Nation, and Anishinaabe encompasses all of those nations that was mentioned in the uh, land acknowledgement at the start. The Mississaugas are one of those, so we are our own separate nation and our own separate people with our own separate customs and traditions, as I said. Uh, and of course, here's the chief signing that relationship accord, and this took place in, uh, at the time, it was Mississaugas of the New Credit. Um, and we continue on that relationship today. Uh, we 
have remained resilient in reestablishing that connection. So of course it was not lost as I say, we'll continue. So the resilience part, we have the reform, reformation of our governance of the Mississauga nations. Um, but this time though, it's taken away from the Indian Act and we're actually starting from our traditional form of, forms of governments within the clan system and within our shared history and our shared customs and traditions. Uh, this of course is a little bit of a slow process only because it's something that we're not used to. We are of course used to the band enforced election system and the band enforced governance, which is totally different from our, our traditional governance. So we approach it from this way and we take our time in, in, uh, in this approach. And we're hoping that this helps strengthen our, our Mississauga nation going forward because it is our more natural form of governance that works well for us. Uh, if we got into why the clan system works so well, you might be surprised in the discussion uh, and you might actually be very, uh, you might ask yourself, why the heck don't we do that <laughs> in our own governance structures? So of course, we also have the reclamation of our territory. Uh, of course, that's the Southern Ontario Territory. Uh, we, did, um, we did have to get into skirmishes for control of that territory. Um, although in our history, we noted that we never left that territory. Although we were up along the sh North Shore of Lake Huron and around the lake, um, we were fully aware that we had taken that area and we had control that area prior to leaving. And when it was time to move back into that area, of course, it was easy for us to take control the way we did. Um, you will find other nations within that territory, but there's a long story history through that too, which uh, we hope to share with you one day and hopefully that'll come out sooner or later. Uh, of course, we have the resurgence of our traditions, as I stated, uh, the Mississaugas are coming back together and sharing those old practices that we shared long ago and relearning them with each other and sharing what we know knowledge we have uh, strengthening of our kinship and bonds. Our communities are starting to come back together. Of course, COVID did put a little bit of a damper on that situation, um, but that didn't stop us from still coming together during COVID to uh, release videos um, for uh, the chiefs were releasing videos for our nations and also having uh, teaching moments for our nation on our uh, Facebook page and those sort of things for our people that uh, who were at home and could just see these teachings, uh, whether they be, I think we had some teachings behind smudging and some teachings behind, uh, uh, I know they were trying to get snowshoe making, I'm not sure if they ever did, but they did have sap boiling and all these other sort of things that we do. Uh, and of course, that goes with sharing with our knowledge. And to see any of this, you can follow that at the MississaugaNation.com. And in the future, if you want, you can look at our progress there as we go along. And I think we can go ahead. And I think that's it. That's all I had. So that is our resilience. And as we keep moving forward and as we, um, with the imposition of the Indian Act and all these other things that kind of tried to um, dissuade us from being who we are and trying to break us away from being Anishinaabe and Mississauga, we are still here today and of course we are still thriving in this way and we are still asserting our own governance and we are having that recognized by the Canadian government at the same time. So miigwech, thank you for listening and thank you for having me. Oh, miigwech, Reg. Um, thanks for sharing some of the Mississauga Nation history and, and showing how um, resilient our, uh, our nation, our great nation is miigwech for that. So I'm going to move on um, to Chief Kelly Laraka. Um, I take great pleasure in introducing the chief of my community, the Mississaugas of Skugagalan First Nation, Chief Kelly Laraka. Um, chief Laraka has served on the elected council since 2008 and was first elected as chief in 2013 and just this past June was thankfully re-elected. Her educational achievements include an honors degree in philosophy from Western University, a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Windsor Faculty of Law, and she also spent time on the West Coast studying Aboriginal law at the University of Victoria, and having, after having practiced as a civil litigation lawyer in Toronto. Chief Laraka also serves as the vice chair for the Ogemawaj Tribal Council 
is an elected director on the First Nations National Lands Advisory Board and previously served as a member on the Aboriginal Justice Committee for the Attorney General of Ontario. She was the portfolio chief representative during the claim negotiations arising from the 1923 Williams Treaties. Kelly lives with her husband, Jonathan, and their young son and daughter in Skugog, First Nation. And for your information, Kelly is my first cousin, so I'm especially happy to have her with us tonight. Miigwech, Kelly. Miigwech, Joe. Anin bojo nanjwe makwa kwe indijnikas. Wabzushi dodem, chichak dodem, skugog minisim donjaba. I just, um, for those of you who aren't uh, speakers of uh, the language, I just introduced myself in our uh, Anishinaabe Moan language. Uh, we uh, like to translate, so my, my uh, spirit name is beautiful. It translates to beautiful bear woman. So I would say I locked out in the name department. <laughs> my uh, elder Harold Ashkway, who's passed on now, he gifted me with that name. And I said, I am of the, um, the uh, Martin clan as uh, traditionally um, our people, if uh, we were of mist mixed ancestry, we would be uh, sort of grouped with the, with the Martin clan. And my uh, last name, as it signifies, I am uh, of mixed ancestry. I'm, I'm uh, part Italian, uh, which I always like to acknowledge. Um, and I also identify with the Crane clan. Um, given that uh, that was my my the clan on my mother's side and uh, and Jill's side as it as it is um, and uh, and of course I'm from the Mississaugas of Skugog Island First Nation uh, the uh, First Nation of which I very proudly serve as the chief and have the honor and privilege of continuing to do so so I uh, as you know it's really difficult to follow um, Grand Council Chief uh, Reg uh, Niganob because he's a pretty awesome speaker and uh, just really engaging in how he presents our history. I'm not going to go sort of deep into the into the history, but really just to give you a few um, a bit of an overview of our of our small community. Uh, warning: I am very bad with dates. Uh, I never would profess to be a historian, but I could tell you a bit about our small community, which is on the northernmost tip of Skugog Island. So um, our community, as, as uh, Chief Reg mentioned, um, is part of the Mississauga Nation. We are Anishinaabe, uh, cu culturally, we are Anishinaabe people. And so we are part of that Anishinaabe Nation of which uh, Chief Reg is the leader. Uh, we are looking at nation building efforts with the Mississauga Nation, as Chief Reg mentioned, and very proudly signed on to that relationship accord a few years ago and um, committed ourselves with our sister uh, communities to engage in nation building. So really, that is, I would say, the biggest project of resilience that um, eh, that anyone could probably find in amongst um, First Nations country, as we call it, because it's about reclaiming the identity and history of and culture and language of who you are as a as an individual, as a community and as a larger uh, part of a larger community or nation, as it were. So I think um, that is really the best example currently of the resilience that we have, uh, having come together after 150 years of forced separation, our communities decided to uh, come back together, even after colonial efforts at separating us. Um, and, you know, it's very difficult. It's a long, uh, long term agenda to try and nation build in the way we're seeking. But I think it's uh, the, the greatest example of resilience of our people who have been fragmented, not only because of the reservation system, but also um, because of the loss of language and culture and, um, and things like residential schools in the 60s school. So 
Um, I'm I'm Anishinaabe Kwe from Scugog First Nation, and uh, my my small but mighty community, as I like to say, uh, we're again the, we're on the northern tip of Scugog Island. That's uh, technically in the the township of Scugog in the town of Port Perry, but of course we would see ourselves as uh, separate and an, an, an individual community. Um, we're a very proud community. We have a total population, I believe we're at 248 now, which is, uh, sounds very tiny and it is small by comparison to other First Nations, but we're very proud of the fact that uh, we've managed to grow our population and our health and edu education outcomes uh, from when I think we were down to something like 14 people. Uh, and I believe a study was done that by it 2035, Jill would remember, I think Jill went to the conference where they were presenting on this study that our community was, uh, 20, was it 2025, Jill? Yep. Wow. So uh, by 2025, it was uh, predicted that um, our people would be non-existent at Scugog. So that was a very grim uh, outlook and uh, future for us. Uh, so we were very glad that uh, due to the due to the ongoing efforts of advocates in uh, Indigenous Canada, working to push those boundaries of status and membership uh, within the Indian Act, um, we were able to grow our population through two successive legislative changes uh, through the Indian Act. And of course, as many communities are across Canada, we're looking at uh, things like citizenship or membership laws for ourselves, which of course, present no, no uh, shortage of complexity. Um, so our community, as I mentioned, has 248 people. Uh, that's divided. Uh, there are about 71 people on reserve uh, and their families. And then the rest of our um, Scugog First Nation members are scattered across Canada and as far as the United States and Hawaii. <laughs> we have one in Hawaii. I hope to go visit them. Uh, anyway, I, I, um, it makes for very interesting community consultations because we've had, um, uh, we have a huge pool of members in and amongst the Toronto and Niagara region. Uh, so a family or two that have gone out there and settled in that area. We also have a very large contingent of our members that live in the North Vancouver area. So um, we're often sort of pulled between three major, you know, city centers or points uh, where our people live. So it makes for interesting community consultation. Now with the advent of Zoom and all of this online business that we're in, uh, hopefully that will get easier. Um, what I, what I want to share is that Scugog First Nation, as I mentioned, we're small but mighty. Many people would know us as a community that is the host uh, and owner of the uh, Great Blue Heron Casino, uh, which does, you know, is, is on our land up in uh, Scugog First Nation. Um, but we're proud of a particular history that is, again, resilient because we were uh, expected to be extinct and yet we're proliferating. We have a huge contingent of people with their PhDs. I think one of our, our, our oldest, uh, one of our eldest members uh, just received her PhD a few years ago and she was 81. Um, so we're particularly proud about the fact that um, our community is um, committed to lifelong learning uh, in both the mainstream and non-mainstream settings. I'd say our community is most resilient uh, when I look back at our at our uh, tiny community's history, there are people, as as Chief Reg had mentioned, um, were said to have come down from in and around the Sault Ste. Marie area, and um, what from what um, I understand through the Williams Treaties case experience, uh, we also were settled at Balsam Lake uh, near Indian Point, and our people were sort of deployed as um, sort of, I guess, the, the best of the best hunters, uh, fishers, uh, and, um, and basically harvesters to, to the northern point of Scugog Island, where it was seen as a, a summer hunting ground. So our people go there every summer and they would be strategically sedentary. I always love telling this, using that phrase, people see uh, 
indigenous people as you know sort of hunter gatherer societies as though we had no governance structures or methodologies or strategies around how we organized ourselves and lived but we were actually strategically sedentary in how we lived so our people were deployed out to Scugog, a certain segment of people who went out to that area again to harvest at the time when it made the most sense and there was the most bounty uh, so our people ended up at Scugog and uh, hunted, fished, trapped in that area, gathered all the the um, berries that were out that are out there naturally. And I guess it was in and around the time when the Trent Severn waterway, um, when it was flooded, um, the area where Scugog First Nation is now was was completely flooded and basically uninhabitable. So our people were ended up being forcibly removed by uh, the federal government. Uh, they would, of course, seen that as part of their fiduciary duty to um, forcibly remove the quote unquote Indians who are in the area. And they moved our community to uh, a place called Coldwater, which is in and around Aurelia and uh, part of and, and, and basically put us with another band uh, out there. So of course, resources were pretty scarce and we weren't exactly welcome at the time. I mean, we were, but we weren't because resources were so scarce and the, the government imposed that upon us and the people at Coldwater. So the chief, uh, Joseph Crane at the time, decided to, uh, a couple of years later, later, move our people back to Scugog Island. So they decided to pick up and move back only to find that all of the land that they harvested all, all along the waterfront of Scugog Island had been taken up by private ownership. As it turned out, there was one piece of land left. If you look at a map, it's a figure eight, basically. And our people at the time decided, we're going to buy that back. We love that land and we're going to live there. That's the land, the land we know and love. So they ended up buying it back with some treaty annuity money that had been saved up over time. And um, that in, in turn became Scugog First Nation um, or Reserve Number 34 as it was known back way back then. Um, so our people, uh, I think we have a, a proud history of never giving up. <laughs> uh, we know uh, the land that we that we engage with, that we love, and that we want to, to steward. And uh, we didn't give it up willingly. And so at that time, we purchased that land back. We still don't have, technically, we still don't have uh, lands that are part of our First Nation that are waterfront. However, we've been very fortunate to, um, to uh, use our, our, our monies in a way to buy back land that does have water frontage. And so we purchased back a couple of major properties along the island and uh, are using that as a community in different ways to uh, access Scugog, Lake Scugog. Of course, having uh, tr rights through Treaty 20, which do, uh, um, that, that do stretch along into Lake Scugog. And uh, now we're finally exercising our fishing rights again. And so I'm very excited about that. Uh, doing so in a, in, a, in a way that is uh, recognized and legal as it were, uh, which of course our fishing rights were denied for so, so many years uh, since the 1923 Williams treaties were signed. So I think our community has, uh, has evolved a lot. We uh, realized the need to build economy uh, as all First Nations know that pressure. Um, but we, uh, we uh, ended up using our, our uh, location to, to our advantage, I suppose, in, in uh, bidding back in the late 90s for an opportunity for gaming in First Nations in Ontario. And that's how the Great Blue Heron ended up coming to Scugog. I believe it was, you know, obviously uh, good good relationships and, and hard work, but also a, a bit of uh, mixed with a little bit of luck as to our location, which is why our community ended up winning a bid for gaming. So since the 90s, we've really um, thrown a lot of our, our, our work, our money, our efforts towards um, education, health care, um, lands and uh, it's really it's really done well to uh, make for a stronger more vibrant and resilient community so I'm just uh, I'm actually just 
completely blown away at the change uh, that uh, Skugog has, has endured over the years. Um, but I'm ex extremely excited to be a part of it. I, I just think that it's a very great time. It, it's a difficult time to be a chief, uh, but I don't think it ever wasn't. And I, and I think that things um, evolve uh, in leadership and our people have a very keen sense as to um, when they need leaders in at certain times. And, you know, I think back to our community in the early days when I moved there um, in the early 90s, I was born and raised part of my life in South Oshawa, um, then moved to the First Nation in 92. And the chief then really took care of our people and, and the children in the community. She was very youth focused, um, you know, and then followed up by a chief who was very economic development focused then followed up by another chief and council who were focused more on, um, who, who were actually pretty rough and tumble, if you will, <laughs> and really fought to get into the, to the boardrooms of the casino, and which is what was needed at that time. And then after that, we had a chief and council who focused on uh, health and education and getting our, building our members up and lifting them up, them up in the ways they needed support. And now uh, we're focused on other things and, uh, and back to economic development to try and build an economy that does not rely on, on regulated, heavily regulated industries such as gaming. Um, and really that's uh, one of the things that, uh, that I've, I've learned is you really can't do that without nation building. And so that's, I think it's dovetailed quite nicely with our rekindling of the Mississauga nation. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. I look forward to the rest of the discussion, but um, I just want to say, um, you know, when there was a question I noticed in the chat about what's the difference between a hereditary chief and an elected chief. I know Reg touched on that a bit, but um, I can say, I always say to people when I'm asked that question, you know, hereditary chiefs um, were chiefs through lineage, uh, through clan systems. Hereditary chiefs were not applied evenly or equally across different cultural tribal groups across Canada. Um, however, uh, same type of mindset. It just might have changed in, in the method as to how these chiefs were 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 chosen or appointed. Um, of course, the, the Indian Act system is a, is federally regulated and appoints a you know democratic or arguably quasi democratic system to electing its chief and councils, much akin to other councils you'd find in a municipality. However, you know people ask me, is the hereditary chief system dead? And I say to them, absolutely not. <laughs> and because I don't honestly believe I ever would have been elected had my mother not served on the council and my uncle not served as chief and my grandfather had not served as chief. And I think that that's a big part of our cultural fabric is to understand the lineage of people and the clans they come from even if it's not completely intact, those things were never lost. So that shows the resilience of our people and I'm particularly proud of that. And I'd love to hear uh, the other chief's thoughts on that, but uh, that's how I see it anyway. I don't think it is totally dead uh, and I'm not at all. And I'm very proud of that. Proud of our people for preserving it. So miigwech for your time and for listening. <laughs> oh, miigwech Kelly. Um, it's so cool to listen to the progression over the years. Like I know, that, you know, being a, a community member, I know all this stuff, but when you sit and listen to it and listen to the, you know, from the way back in the 17, 1800s up, up until what's happened today, it's, it's really quite amazing. So thank you for sharing all of that with us. Um, it just shows that a small First Nation can really be a mighty one. <laughs> And so um, we will get back to you, um, Kelly, with questions later on. Um, next up, I just have to pull it up here. Okay, now we have the very recently re-elected chief from Alderville First Nation, Chief Dave Mowat. Dave Mowat is a First Nation historian and conservationist. He was a band council he was a band council member from 2007 to 2015 and the community's economic development director between 1995 and 2007. 
prior to those dates, he was a staff member when he was researching his first history book. And by the way, he is an amazing jazz musician as well. Um, Dave and I go way back from our economic development Oops. days. <laughs> yes. And I'm, and I'm honored to call him my friend and welcome him to tonight's session. Miigwech, Dave. Miigwech, Joe. Good to see you again. Always. Yeah, Joe and I go way back. Good to see you. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank Jill and uh, her colleagues for inviting me here tonight. Uh, and uh, I want to also acknowledge uh, my fellow chiefs that are in assembly tonight, as well as uh, our Grand Council Chief uh, Reg Miganabi. Um, well spoken Grand Council Chief, as he is. And great presentation, Reg. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of a brief uh, overview. Uh, um, <clears throat> I have been at Alderville First Nation um, since 1990, actually. Uh, I was in Winnipeg at that time, but I came home and started working for the band <clears throat> in 1990 uh, on a history book. And then I went back to Winnipeg, came back in 1995 full time and built my home <clears throat> on the, uh, the edge of the Black Oak Savannah, the tall grass prairie, Alderville's beautiful, renowned Black Oak Savannah and tall grass prairie, world renowned. And um, I raised my family here with my wife, Janet Sagoski, <clears throat> Janet Day. Uh, Jan, uh, my wife, Jan, and I have known each other since we were teenagers, but she was raised in Curve Lake. She's a band member of Serpent River, which is a neighbor of uh, uh, the Grand Council Chiefs community of Mississauga 8. Um, and uh, we raised our children here uh, from young ones. And um, so uh, we've been here for a long time. Uh, Alderville First Nation was uh, created, established in 1837. And our people came from the Bay of Quinney. So our tradition and our, our history is embedded at the Bay of Quinney. Um, uh, the other Mississauga communities, like uh, Chief Kelly was mentioning, Scugog and um, uh, Indian Point. Um, I should also say I was also um, uh, uh, an employee of Scugog Island First Nation for seven, seven and a half years, a proud employee of Scugog Island First Nation. And Kelly was chief uh, all through those years. I was a consult consultation specialist there. I started in January 2008, 2013, actually, and I um, uh, was elected in July 2019, but I stayed on for probably eight months or so after that, uh, assisting, and then uh, um, transitioned in, in fully into my position here. So proud, proud employee and uh, um, of, of Scugog Island First Nation and established a real strong affinity for the community and for the people and, um, and for the history as well. Um, and, you know, it's interesting just for everybody, for the listeners here, how we are all sort of related in some way or some form. You know, my wife was raised in Curve Lake. Um, her grandmother was Adeline Coppaway. Um, and, uh, uh, and she's been a band member of Serpent River. And, um, um, you know, so our, our community is in our, in our southern Ontario region and even up along the North Shore. Uh, where Mississauga is or Serpent River, uh, there's there's this sort of familial link between a lot of us, which is really in, unique. Um, so it it, um, it allows us to uh, understand each other's histories and and um, uh, we, there's a lot of shared um, history and there's a lot of shared experiences and a lot of commonalities between all of our communities that keeps us very close and feeds into our resilience. Um, so on that point, Alderville First Nation, um, the, our ancestors at the Bay of Quinney were some of the first to see settlement come into the Lake Ontario frontier. Uh, after the American Revolution in 1783, 
um, the British, of course, uh, were um, uh, obligated to resettle what we know now today as United Empire Loyalists. And they uh, settled upwards of 50,000 of those American colonists who remained loyal to the king. Uh, they settled them at the, um, the St. John River uh, what, in what became New Brunswick. Uh, they settled them in the province of Quebec. And also west of Quebec, west of the province, the colonial province of Quebec uh, at the Bay of Quinney. And of course, that meant that our people were um, early uh, recipients, if you will, of that whole experience. And um, so one of the earlier land purchases that took place in order to settle the colonists was what's called the Crawford Purchase at the Bay of Quinney. And um, uh, Kingston became the center of that sort of early settlement period. Um, in fact, Kingston, the township of Kingston, uh, was the first township to be surveyed in what becomes Upper Canada. And, um, and so our people, um, they, they were uh, early on in the settlement period and the colonization period in uh, Upper Canada. They, um, our people at to the Bay of Quinney were um, some of the first to experience that influx. And, and it wasn't good. It wasn't positive. Uh, you know, strangely, though, our people uh, who else who also came in was also the, the Six Nations uh, or the Mohawks. Um, they came into the Bay of Quinty after the Crawford Purchase was uh, achieved. And they were established at what we know today as the Tyananega Mohawk Territory. Um, and, um, and so it was not the white settlers that our people were concerned about at this period of time. It was actually the Mohawks that our people were concerned about because that was going to, in their view, increase the pressure on our hunting grounds. And um, so, you know, in history, you can't take offense to things in history. You'll never get it right if you take offense to things in history. You just got to be ice cold when it comes to the historical record. And so that's, that's the way it was. Our people were not impressed with, with the fact that the Mohawks would be coming in and exerting pressure on our, what we saw as our, as our hunting grounds. Um, what they did see, uh, the advantage of having settlement close white settlement close is that they would have better access to better trade goods. That's the way it was. They saw the advantage of being close to white settlement, which would give them access to better trade goods. That same thing applied to this, uh, the uh, predecessors of the Scugog Island First Nation Mississaugas at Indian Point. They felt that they were too far out of the way and that they felt that they would be closer to better trade opportunities at Lake Scugog. Um, so at the Bay of Quinty, um, you know, one can, if one starts to peel back the historical record, you'll see that the racism becomes embedded very quickly. Um, by 1792 and 1793, the wife of the Lieutenant Governor uh, <clears throat> Simcoe, she didn't help matters when she said our people were a dirty, drunken, unwarlike tribe. She didn't help matters at all. She published that in writing. Our people were dirty, unwarlike, um, idle. And, um, and uh, not too long after this period, the people at the Bay of Quinty area settlers start to develop an attitude towards our, towards our people. And, uh, and there are quotes where our people are seen as dirtier than the cleanest hogs that were possessed by the white settlers. So that's pretty derogatory. Um, and so, you know, I'm on the, uh, I'm on uh, the city of Kingston, uh, Johnny McDonald 
uh, legacy um, working committee for the city of Kingston. And um, myself and Chief Merrick were on that committee together. And, um, and it's um, an interesting position to be in when you start to discuss these sort of things, these, these racist attitudes that were embedded so early in our relationship with the white settlers at the Bay of Quinney. Um, um, you know, the way I look at it, the Iroquois, the First Nations, or the Iroquois, the Six Nations, the Mohawks at Tyananega, they got a 92,000, I think it was about 92,000 acre reserve that was surveyed out after the Crawford Purchase was negotiated. Our people got nothing. The Mississaugas got nothing. They became paupers on their own land. They wandered. They got sick. They were victims of alcoholism. And it's not a nice history. Our people experienced the worst of the worst, in my view, at the Bay of Quinney. And then they met Methodism in the 1820s. And Methodism was seen uh, by some of our people as a means to survive in the face of encroachment, in the face of uh, broken treaty promises, in the face of seeing their hunting lands and hunting grounds being overrun. And so Methodism for them at that time in the mid 1820s was a, a means of survival, a means of surviving in the face of, of white settlement. And, um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's sort of a sad history, but uh, it's a fascinating history too. The Methodist Mississauga uh, history at the Bay of Quinney is quite fascinating. What, what the product of that relationship was is quite fascinating as a historian is very fascinating. Um, but uh, by the 1830s, uh, our people were established uh, on a, a small 10 acre island in the Bay of Quinney called Grape Island. And that's where they were converted and, and uh, baptized and became a part of the Methodist fold and um, were taught carpentry and, uh, and farming. And, um, and, and that's where you also see the division of labor start to occur where the girls and the young women are separated from activities on the land and they're expected to be in the home now where they should be making the bed and learning how to be domestic quote unquote servants. And, and so out of that period, we see this assimilationist agenda take hold. And so uh, from Grape Island, our people uh, eventually, um, they uh, write the government and attempts are made to move them off of Grape Island. And uh, so eventually by 1835, new lands are sought in Elder Township or Annick Township, as it would be called in Scotland. Um, here in Northumberland County, 16 miles north of Coburg. And these lands, 2000 acres at first were uh, secured, um, strangely by the Lieutenant Governor of the day, Colburn, in, uh, in la on lands that were never surrendered property in what's known in this area as the Gunshot Treaty. Um, and so our people came here uh, the, sur the, the reserve was surveyed in 1835. Our people came here in 1837. And, uh, and then so through into the 1840s, uh, there's attempts to educate them. There's attempts to turn them into farmers, uh, keep them on the land, keep them sedentary. And, uh, and then the, uh, by the 18, early 1840s, the Bagot Commission is struck. It's an assimilationist uh, Commission, probably one of the first, probably the first Royal Commission ever established to study the quote unquote Indian problem. Um, our people, I would think, saw themselves having a government problem. Um, the Vega Commission um, studies our people, and uh, out of that period, and enter Egerton Ryerson, we then see the creation of the industrial school. And the industrial school system, it builds on the former manual labor school system. Uh, and one of the earlier mo movers and shakers is a fellow by the name of William Case. And William Case was uh, responsible for helping to establish an industrial school at Alderville First Nation. And Egerton Ryerson is the, the reason why they were called industrial schools. 
It was uh, his report of 1847 that spelled out why they should be called industrial schools. They would combine industry and religion, and they would be uh, they would be employed as a means of teaching our people to survive in the face of the white man and in the face of white settlement. And our people voluntarily approved of this plan. Uh, and the reason I believe and understand at that time is because they saw this as, an, as a, a means of, of uh, helping them to survive in the face of settlement and so that they wouldn't be cheated by the white man and so that they would learn the white man's quote unquote talking books. And so the industrial school plan, which is a predecessor of the residential school system, uh, is established at Alderville First Nation, as it was at Muncie as well. And uh, it survived, all, the industrial school plan only survived for, for 12 years here. And the plan was that other First Nations as well, Mud Lake, uh, Scugog Island, um, uh, Lake Simcoe, even as far west as uh, St. Clair, that the chiefs and communities there would send their children to Alderville to enter the school and to be educated. Uh, but the important thing to remember is that it's 1850s pre-Confederation. There, our people are de facto self-governing. Uh, there is no Indian Act. There is no Section 9124 of the BNA Act. It's all pre, it predates that. This period predates that. So our people are self, de facto self-governing and it's voluntary attendance unlike later in the 1880s and later when the residential school system uh, forces attendance on, on First Nations people. So the Alderville School, Industrial School actually failed. Uh, as a school plan, it failed by 1861 and, and it closed. The school physically stayed there, but the, the, the Industrial School plan failed. And then um, we see 1867, Confederation, uh, Section 9124, check that out for yourselves. Uh, the federal parliament uh, acquired uh, authority over uh, Indians and lands reserved for the Indians. And then we proceed into 1876 and the Indian Act, which was established by a liberal government, not a conservative government. Johnny McDonald was not in power at that time. In fact, it was David Laird. Uh, MP who actually stick handled the, the Indian Act through Parliament. John A. had been uh, kicked out of office because of the Pacific scandal. But he would pick it back up in 1878 when he's reelected. Um, 1879, he uh, commissions Nicholas Davin to do a report on residential schools in America uh, because by this time, the treaty process in the West has become entrenched. Um, treaty seven is, is uh, negotiated uh, in 1877. So the West is opening. And what are we gonna do with the Indians? We have gotta do something with the Indians. They can't be running around the land and claiming that they own the land. I'm being, I'm being facetious, but it pisses me off. And, uh, and so we see the establishment of the residential school system, which now the government has established the legal and the legislative authority to impose this on the people. And another thing too that people have to remember is that what better way to um, what better way to acquire or to gain authority over a people than to um, make them poor? Um, what better way to um, conquer a people? without war than to uh, flood alcohol into their communities. It's no different than today. There's communities in all over the place that are uh, uh, suffer the same thing. Um, you know, so alcohol and the use of those, uh, those nasty things that uh, were used to uh, try to break down the communities. Um, you know, in the West, it was uh, um, the loss of the buffalo, you know, so it's it's sort of a rapid, it's a rapid sort of uh, experience that occurred all over Canada, and um, and so in Alderville's case, 
uh, after the Indian Act came down, and once the imposition of the federal government, the Dominion government really became embedded, then we see a very dire situation amongst our communities. And I'm going to just, uh, I won't get too further into the weeds. I want to give you an example of resilience uh, that comes out of this period. In the 1870s, we started to see trespass roads run across all the First Nations. First Nations people always suffered from encroachment. Uh, quote on Indian lands were always encroached upon. And when I use the term Indian, I use this historically. Indian lands were always being encroached upon. We're always the target of being usurped by, by uh, uh, you know, by, uh, by traders, uh, by, American, by the American colonies. Uh, so Indian lands were very, very valuable. And, uh, and so our people always dealt with encroachment. In fact, the Royal Proclamation of 1763, one of the aims was to stop the encroachment. Um, but uh, when, we, when we come into the 1870s in, in Alderville, there's a lot of in trespassing, a lot of trespass roads that start to crisscross our reserve. And it is in the 1870s that our people start to complain about this. And the surveyor, uh, Dalton, in 1879, he didn't like it either, actually. Uh, and he complained to the municipal government uh, about it, and they didn't want to do anything about it. They basically said, we're not going to give you any information. We don't even want to talk to you. And, uh, and so this, uh, this issue of encroachment and this issue of uh, trespass roads across our reserve and the fact that people were living on the reserve that had no right to live on the reserve, this progressed over 150 years. It was in 2009 when we entered into First Nations land management. The Scugog Island First Nation is one of the first 14 First Nations in Canada to enter into the original First Nations land management. Act of 1996, I believe, 97. Um, we uh, we started to uh, uh, enter into the First Nations Land Management Act process. And what that means is that there's about 30 or 40 provisions in the Indian Act that deal with land. And the FNLMA, uh, it, what it does is it, uh, once, once you su successfully negotiate it, it gives the First Nations control over those 30 or 40 provisions of the Indian Act. So you become the authority over your lands. So that's what we entered into in 2009. Out of that process, we had to do a legal land description. And that is when we learned that in fact, Alderville First Nation possessed, possessed 11.2 kilometers of road that was once deemed to be municipal roads. And so it's been 10 years that we have been going through the process of arriving at a negotiated agreement in which we will now officially take control over those roads that were once deemed to be municipal roads. And when you talk about resilience, you know, our rights, our rights predate the Crown's rights, in my view, our rights predate 1763. We didn't give, we didn't, the Crown didn't give us rights. We gave the crown rights to come in here and establish itself in the first place in Eastern North America. The First Nations give the crown rights. And you need to go back to the 1764 Niagara Treaty and the, and the Great Belt uh, of the Covenant Chain to understand that. But um, our people always knew we had the right to be where we are and, and to, uh, to survive and, and to, um, to live the way we wanted to live. And, and so for 10 years, uh, I've now inherited this file, this municipal road file. And I can successfully say that uh, about two weeks ago, myself and the mayor of the local Elmick Haldeman Township, we signed an agreement in principle to resolve this issue. And it's just, it's just one issue of resilience. It's one issue of standing up for yourself. It's one issue of a community standing up for its rights and saying, no way, no way.
are we going to ever bow down to anybody when we know that we're right and we know what's ours? And that is my, that's the way I look at it when it comes to Alderville First Nation. There's no way that anybody is going to come into this community and run roughshod over us like occurred prehistory and or occurred even in the 19th century. Um, you know, we, we are people's, you talk about education, um, you talk about an 81 year old woman getting her PhD. That's just, that's one of the most classic examples of resilience. And our people have uh, uh, achieved so much because of that. Our people have achieved so much because they didn't roll over because they knew our people inherently knew what our rights are. Our people inherently knew that we have as much right as anybody else to protect our lands and to stand up for our history and to stand up for our, our, uh, our environment. And so the roads issue, pretty boring file to take on. Pretty boring. It's not sexy, but it's just one example of resilience and it's one example of how long it can take when you're dealing with either with a municipality or the province or Canada. It's just one example of how long it takes to achieve um, uh, one's you know, objective. And the Williams Treaties um, Settlement Agreement is another example of how long it takes sometimes to successfully achieve one's objective. Um, so, uh, you know, I could go on, I could give you 10 other uh, examples of resilience, but I'll, I'll leave it there. I want to thank you uh, all for uh, for attending and uh, supporting live entertainment. Thank you very much. <laughs> Miigwech, Dave. Um, thanks for sharing that uh, history of Aldrill. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, were unfamiliar with that. So Miigwech for, um, for sharing that and showing how resilient the community of Alderville really is and has been over the last hundred, several hundred years. Um, so we're, we're just running a little short on time. So I'm gonna um, introduce our last speaker. Um, let me just pull it up here. Okay, last but not least, I have the pleasure to introduce Chief Emily Weetung of the Mississaugas of Curve Lake First Nation. Chief Emily grew up in Curve Lake First Nation and left only to pursue a higher education at Trent University and Osgoode Hall Law School. She married a Mohawk man from Wata and convinced him to build a life on the Shamong side of Curve Lake. She returned to Curve Lake 10 years ago and practiced real estate law in Peterborough and is raising two lovely boys. Chief Emily has worked to advance relations with municipal, provincial, and federal governments and sits on many committees and working groups with the Mississauga Nation Chiefs, the Chiefs of Ontario, and the Anishinaabek Nation. She continues to use her expertise and knowledge to ensure that the voices of Indigenous people are heard and respected. Miigwech for sharing with us tonight, Chief Weetung. I'm Chief Emily Weetung of Curve Lake First Nation of the Moose Clan. Chief Laraka thought that following Grand Chief Niganab was difficult, uh, but try and going at the end of these amazing leaders. <laughs> Hopefully I have something interesting left to say. I'd like to take a moment to recognize and appreciate the land acknowledgement that was offered today. But personally, I like to encourage everyone to take an extra moment to think about what it means and why we have begun saying it. My Shomis, or grandfather in English, who was 99 when he journeyed to the spirit world in February, would tell me stories about his great grandparents who lived in this area. Not just the small reserve that is currently recognized as Curve Lakes land base, but this entire area of Southern Ontario, from Ottawa to Sault Ste. Marie, the far side of Toronto, all the way beyond Niagara Falls, we shared this territory with our Mississauga relatives. My show Mrs. stories about his great grandparents reach back to tell us the stories of his great grandparents, great grandparents. <laughs> In this way of telling our stories, we have an oral history of our people dating back hundreds and often thousands of years. 
So when we have the land acknowledgement, we are recognizing that this land that we are all here to discuss was used and occupied by my ancestors. We take the time to recognize the treaties and land acknowledgements often too, because that treaty is what created a formal contractual relationship for our ancestors to share the land and resources with your ancestors. It's the foundation for having the space for all of those gathered here today to live together and learn and all of the other things you do every day that you work to achieve. Sometimes it's surprising to me that we've lived in such close proximity for so long, and yet so many people know so little about our communities and Curve Lake First Nation. My community is located only a little bit north of Peterborough, a straight shot down Highway 115. It's a beautiful peninsula surrounded on three sides by water. Our culture, language, and old ways of living are still with us and are practiced every day by our community members. Over the last century, we've begun merging our traditions with becoming a modern community, opting for a democratic governance, governance system even before it was forced on so many under the Indian Act, as you've already heard today. My Chishomis, great-grandfather, and his Shomis also served as chief in their time. And as Chief LaRocca has shared, this is a significant factor when our communities come to vote in our democratic processes. Opting for democratic processes doesn't prevent the hereditary, the heredity of leadership when it's culturally ingrained in who we are. We have lofty aspirations that we continue to pursue to the benefit of our people today and to secure our future for the great grandchildren of our great grandchildren. I want to recognize our ancestors who shaped and made our First Nation the great place it is today. And I would like to invite all of you to get to know my community virtually for now and in person when it's once again safe to gather. Our foundational belief is balance. We need balance in our world for things to continue to be plentiful and to sustain us. We need water to sustain us and fire to keep us warm. While many believe that there was no ownership system in First Nations prior to contact, I have to say that this is simply not true. We have always understood that our future generations owned the lands and the resources, that we have borrowed these lands and resources from them, and we have an obligation to return the lands and resources to them when they get here. When I was elected chief, I looked out my office window to see our daycare. Now, whenever I pause in my work for any reason, I look up to see my community's infants and toddlers coming outside to their playground to enjoy the sunshine. It is a good reminder to me every day as I watch these little ones figure out how to walk that I am in my role to ensure their future, to the, ensure the future of my community. In recent weeks, when I look out my window, I'm so grateful for the hard won ability to educate our children here at home. And more than that, I'm grateful for every child who's here, that they have survived another generation and are not lost hidden and buried on some distant school ground. It is also important to know that for the Mississaugas, when we talk about our relations, all our relations living in balance, we mean as you do our parents and siblings, our aunts and uncles, our cousins and their cousins. All human beings in fact are our relations. When we say all our relations, we also mean more than our human relatives. Our relations include the four-legged animals and the fur-bearing animals. Our relations include the plant species and the insects. Our relations include our mother, the earth, and all that she provides to us. When you start from a point of all things being related to you, you begin to recognize that we must only take what we need. By taking only what we need, there will be enough left for those who own the land, the grandchildren of our children's grandchildren. We believe in sharing the land with all our relations and living in balance. We are able to benefit from what Mother Earth has given us. I hope you find these cultural beliefs interesting enough to explore further, but I have shared them with you not just because they are important to understand who we are as the Mississaugas, but because it is important to us that our resiliency, our ability to adapt new ways of living are fundamentally grounded in these beliefs. For my community, the journey to clean drinking water has been an ongoing journey for over 40 years. 
You may have seen some articles recently about this struggle and our journey in the news. And it's a journey I freely share with you. The importance of our need to access clean water is that, living on a peninsula, we have been unable to see significant development or even sufficient housing for those who would live at who would like to live at home on the land base that we have been left with. Despite the lack of clean drinking water, our community has pursued advancements in education, keeping our young ones as close to home as often as possible, integrating wherever we can our language and our teachings into the formative years of our children. Our early learning center has a land-based approach with significant integration of our language into all programming. We are also beginning a fish hatchery program in our K-3 school to introduce our children to concepts of conservation and environmental restoration at an early age. With proponents in our territory, we are pursuing inclusion of early learning about a variety of industries to ensure that our children can see themselves achieving anything they put their minds to in the future. To me, it is important that we are treated with respect and equality, that we are viewed and valued as partners with not only historic rights that impact the way that impact any and all development, but as relations who have agreed to live together, to work together, and to share this space into the future. The pandemic has amplified so many issues of poverty and food security across our communities. We are often told that the best health measures are hand washing. But in so many of our homes, hand washing means rashes and open sores. We see our environment all around us under constant threat of destruction, but we do not accept that this is the way that it should be. And I think that that's a significant part of resiliency. We are taking aggressive steps to restore harmony and balance with our mother, the earth. Long-term, we have a goal to protect and preserve an area of land where we can practice our traditions, where we can protect those species that are significant to us, or that are in danger of disappearing. An area of land where our traditions and ceremonies can be practiced in safe, protected spaces, where we have a space to hunt, plant, harvest, grow, teach, and learn. This area supports the relationship that we have the, with the land and allows us to exercise our ability to be caretakers of our land. It returns control to us, removes it from a paternalistic system imposed upon us, and provides us with the space necessary to continue to adapt to new ways of living while maintaining those ties to our traditions and, his, and historic understandings of balance between all of our relations. This is our resilience. I'd like to leave it there. I know we're running short on time. So miigwech for joining us. Miigwech to the other Gima, the chiefs in English who have been here this evening with me. You are tough acts to follow and an inspiration to all of our community members. Miigwech. Uh, miigwech, Chief Emily. That was um, that was awesome. I, I love that we ended with you because you just wrapped it up so perfectly. Um, I love your comments on the land acknowledgements. That was amazing um, and so true. And thanks for reminding us that we're all related and how important it is to keep working towards um, resilience in our communities. And uh, it's just been a pleasure to, to listen to all four of you. And um, I wanna open it up now. First, I wanna say a, a chi miigwech to, to all of you for, for, for being here tonight and sharing things about your own communities and making us more aware of what's happening around us. Um, so good to hear from everyone. And now um, I'm gonna go to the Q and A and start asking questions. I think there might be a couple that are um, specific to certain chiefs, but I think for the most part, they're fairly general or to open to anyone, I guess. Um, the first one is Jen Clark. Considering the water recharging systems that feed Lake Ontario and sources of drinking water north of the Oak Ridges Moraine, from the Niagara Escarpment to the Trent River and short-sighted governments that allow development up to the water edge. How do we continue this struggle to preserve the integrity and health of these corridors that support wildness in the city? With wildness, sorry, in the city, a vital resource for our physical, emotional, and spiritual connection to the Mother Earth. 
Anybody want to take on that? Uh, you're on. Uh, I can try. Uh, just because uh, of what we did at the, in the Black Oaks of Tallgrass Prairie, um, uh, for those who uh, uh, have been here, um, the, the Alderville Black Oaks of Tallgrass Prairie is now 130 acres of pristine ecology uh, and a high level of biodiversity. And it's a, a very important water recharge area uh, for our community. Um, and and it's, uh, we actually predate the Oak Ridges Moraine plan of 2003. We started working here in 1999 and 2000. Um, I, by chance, moved, built my house on the south edge of the Black Oak Savannah tall grass. I remember how beautiful it was. And um, so, you know, in the face of a in the face of, uh, we, we have our own development issues here too, and we have encroachments too that occur, but um, it was through education, uh, I would say in, in the, at the First Nation level, it was through education and the hammering home of the same educational sort of uh, lessons about the value of, of this uh, area that our own people actually gravitated towards it and, and started to understand it and, and started to develop an appreciation for what it is. Um, sadly, though, you know, when you're dealing with governments that um, see put the economy before the environment, um, uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to answer. Um, you know, I, I under this government, I have huge concerns about its um, its lack of respect for the environment, and so it behooves the uh, average Ontarian to um, to continue to hammer the points uh, of environmental protection home to your own MPPs and to the mayors that live within the um, Oak Ridges Moraine um, area. Um, I know that um, our, our, the example that we, we have set in Alderville First Nation has now spilled out into the, uh, the surrounding area. And so we have over 20 years of experience protecting this ecological gem here in, in, in Alderville First Nation. Uh, and what we're doing here in Alderville First Nation is what the same thing that the Oak Ridges Moraine plan attempts to do. How do you, how do we take what we've learned here and what we've done here to protect this and, and sort of uh, transition it over to the local municipalities? That's a tough sell. That's a really tough sell. Um, but all I can say is that uh, it takes average citizens to rise up and to keep the pressure on your MPPs, to keep the pressures on your mayors, um, because, uh, you know, we can't speak for you. So it behoo behooves you, the, the average Ontarian, to, to learn and understand the value of the Oak Ridges Moraine and to, to, to understand the biodiversity and, and what it does uh, as far as a water recharge area. It's critically important. Um, if we keep mucking with that, we're going to be in serious trouble, serious trouble. We're in serious trouble now. And so rise up, people. Rise up and educate yourself. Speak out. Speak out. Speak loud. Speak proud. Miigwech. Oh, Jill, you're on mute, I think. Sorry. Um, does anybody else want to take a stab at that, or should I go on to the next question? I, I just want to say that uh, quickly that... Um, People should really take notice about uh, MZOs or municipal zoning orders that the province is uh, laying like a blanket over environmentally protected areas. And um, they're doing it without any consultation or notice <laughs> to, to Ontarians. And so, uh, you know, try and, try and um, take note of that. Start Googling MZOs province. There's new legislation that they, that they uh, passed that only makes it easier for them to gut environmental approvals processes. And uh, so I just um, wanted to uh, put that out there again, ministerial zoning orders, MZOs, uh, check them out. I think uh, there are a lot of concerned citizens about them right now, especially under the leadership of the Ford government who seem to use them like uh, candy. <laughs> anyway, I'll leave it at that. Watch Kelly. Um, 
Uh, I think you already answered this one, Kelly. It was for you. They wanted to know the woman's name who received the PhD at 81. Yeah, um, Shirley, Shirley Sliwa. Shirley Sliwa. I, I'm a, I was wrong. I tried to answer that question in the chat and I said Rosuna Marston, but I know Rosuna right. got yeah. her PhD as well and she's quite elderly. But Yeah, uh, I think Rosuna's 71. She just received hers like last year. Yeah. Right. Which is right. awesome. Okay, so um, another one from Jen. No, these must be all just, <laughs> sorry, from Meg. Uh, remembering the book by Leslie Frost, The Forgotten Pathways of the Trent would be better, would better be recalled as displaced pathways never forgotten. <laughs> I guess it was just a comment. Um, <clears throat> our band chiefs remunerated I believe it was mentioned that Chief Emily practices real estate law. Oh, sorry, that was that was in her introduction that um, before becoming chief, she was practicing real estate law. But uh, yes, there is there is a paycheck involved. Uh, these people have to live. But I'll let um, I'll let anyone jump in if they want to. I think you, uh, you pretty much summed it up there, Jill. Um, <laughs> most of us had careers before this and, uh, and made the choice to come back and contribute to our communities with the skill set that we have. Absolutely. How about Emily? Um, 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 this is from Meg. Okay. Uh, considering how the conservative authorities... Wait, did I read that one already? Um, tech team wise is jumping around on me. I don't understand when it, um, okay, here's one from Leslie. When it comes to self-governance, do First Nations want to be self-governing within the structure of the federal system or do you want to pursue self-governance outside of the federal system? Take her away, Kelly. Do you mind if I, I, I'd love to speak to that a little bit, um, given that we're part of First Nations land management. Uh, so the federal government, for example, uh, passed an act called the First Nations Lands Management Act. And if you think of, you know, a pie, let's say, um, there's that, if you think of the Indian Act like a pie, it has a bunch of different pieces. And one of the major pieces of the Indian Act um, are provisions relating to the management of uh, you know, Indian lands or reserve, reserve lands. And so, you know, back in the early 2000s, I believe it was, or well, I guess it was the late 90s, it was conceived, uh, the, the First Nation, some First Nations chiefs got together and basically lobbied the federal government to come up with a different mechanism for land governance outside of the Indian Act. So they're basically taking that piece of pie outside of the Indian Act, throwing it away and replacing it with a new contractual agreement. And so what it is, there's a framework agreement for First Nations lands management that is basically a contract that was entered into by the, the contracting First Nation parties and the federal government to then um, abide by the terms of this contract, which was enabled through the First Nations Lands Management Act legislation. And so what it does is it basically enables self-governance over uh, First Nation reservation lands. So it's, it's I always say it's measured or incremental self-governance. It's a tiny little piece of that overall pie. It's a very meaningful one. Land is so inherently connected with our people, with our culture, with our language, and and it, and we organize ourselves based on land. And so, you know, to be able to uh, govern govern that uh, in which we all live, it's hugely important and hugely empowering for First Nations themselves. As the way I see it, it's worked out very well for Scugog, and I can say none none of the communities that's entered into lands management has ever wanted to turn around and go back. Um, it's, you know, is it perfect? Absolutely not. Does it, does it replace the whole Indian Act? Absolutely not, unfortunately. Um, 
you know, should we be going farther and striving for something uh, better than the Indian Act and something that is more fulsome self-governance? Uh, yes, I think so. I think we always have to look beyond the Indian Act and try for something better. But that a big part of that is also that nation building piece that we were speaking of earlier in each of our intros um, in terms of the Mississauga Nation. And, and also, uh, in addition to that nation building piece, looking at how we can better implement the rights that we already do have, uh, which were given to us from the creator and happen to be acknowledged in some final settlement agreement through the Williams Treaties. Uh, but, you know, that is the way I see it from our community's perspective. And I think most, you know, of course, we don't always all agree on everything. We're not one um, homogenous voice. But I, I do think the people at Skugog would generally agree that, you know, entering into that lands management process was one tiny step uh, towards the ability to live freely and govern our lands that we live on outside of the Indian Act. But self-governance will always be top of mind. And, and I guess, you know, recognizing that the federal government will never give us the uh, adequate and proper and deserved support that we um, that we need to fully self-govern, uh, incremental is probably best from a strategy point of view, though it may not be what we truly want from a philosophical one. <laughs> anyway, I'll I'll uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Anyone else want to answer that question? Sure, if you don't mind. Or Emily, I see you're getting ready to go ahead. Go ahead, Emily, by all means. No, no, you go ahead. All right. Um, sorry, what was the exact question again? Sorry, just have to pull it up again. Oh, boy. All right. The, uh, Maybe I'll just jump here, in I while think... Bill finds it, if that's OK. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I think the part that I wanted to add is, is the incremental piece that Chief LaRocca has referred to. Um, there's also a financial uh, piece that you can take out from, from the Indian Act as well under the First Nation Fiscal Management Act. Uh, and, and that's the, the avenue that my community is looking at right now before we, we switch to the land. But there's also a great deal of skepticism in our communities about self-government and some of the problems that we've seen with self-government agreements from out west. And, and some hesitation in that regard as well. Um, and I think that's just what I wanted to add briefly. I, I think I remember most of the question, but um, I, that's okay. I trouble with this. <laughs> it's not a problem at all. I, I think the question was more around self-government and self-determination and self-determination being one of the bigger things that we're always striving for, um, especially since, uh, you know, prior to Canada, prior to colonial contact, prior to everything, we did have a form of governance that we practiced. Uh, it was very effective. We had forms of governance, as uh, Emily touched on, in um, uh, uh, in forms of uh, relationships. All our relations is the term that we use. So we had relationships with not only each other, but the animals. And there were treaties between us and animals and treaties between us and the land and these sort of different things. And then, of course, like I mentioned, or as Kelly mentioned, also the clan governance system, when she talks about her clan, she's talking, as soon as she mentions where her clan is from, she's telling me exactly what her role is. I don't even have to hear the rest of what she's talking about. So those are important forms of governance that we do have uh, that are more congruent to our, our way of living, I guess, and our way of decision making, mostly important around decision making is that form of governance, uh, clan governance in that system. But uh, self-government is nothing new. Uh, uh, you've all heard of, perhaps you've heard of the two-role wampum. Uh, that asserts that uh, we would be traveling in our separate vessels down the same river and we would not interfere with each other, meaning that Aboriginal governments would be separate from European governments or Canadian government or whoever they might come in contact with. Um, also, too, you have the, uh, the Royal Proclamation Treaty of Niagara, that affirms that we're separate nations and separate governments and we will respect each other. And then you have our treaties, which are actually treaties between nations uh, that affirm that we are our own self entities also. So those are some things to look at. And then you can even look at the, um, when the constitution was formed here in Canada, 
the discussions that First Nations pushed for and had around those constitutional talks. And one of the bigger discussions within that was self-government and self-determination for First Nations. That, of course, never came to fruition in any way, shape, or form. Um, that's why we have these piecemeal approaches now of self-government agreements, uh, lands management agreements, things that take us out of the Indian Act. Those things were all supposed to be discussed and uh, addressed within those constitutional talks back in the 80s. And uh, so that's where we're at now. If you can look at things like the RCAP and all these other sort of different uh, reports that have come out over all these several years, they all indicate the same thing. And it's that First Nations seek self-determination and self-government for themselves. And there's many different ways that can be configured. Uh, uh, even within the RCAP, it, it suggests a third order of government for the First Nations in line with the provinces and the federal government. So um, those options are out there. It's just the will and the desire to actually implement them. Thank you much, Chief. Um, sorry, I have to apologize. It seems like Zoom is glitching tonight a little bit, so I'm having trouble with the Q&A, but did everyone have the opportunity to respond to that? that wanted to? Yes, okay, we'll go on to the next question. Um, ooh, this is a big one. How do you meet the emotional needs of Indigenous children when faced with the current disclosures about residential schools? I am the grandmother of two Indigenous children and am brought to my knees in the face of this history. They are learning of what <clears throat> they are learning of what my historical culture has done to their history and to them how are how do i talk to them about this panelists kelly uh, no i i think uh neglect for that very important question i think that it's a very difficult one simply. Um, for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people face. Um, I can say that, you know, I grappled with that too because I um, I have a young family and, and a daughter who's six and her school asked if I would go and uh, speak to her class and to a couple of the grades as well in the public school. And uh, I just realized like I had three classes I was speaking to and Ruby's, uh, my daughter, she's six. Her class was the first of the three and then the classes went up from there in grade level. And I went in the first one and it was really, it was a tough round because these kids were, you know, tough to sit and focus and listen. And of course they're so innocent and sweet and all you can do is think about them. And of course all the children that have been uh, located in the past while. But I, uh, you know, I realized that just being being honest with them uh, is was really the best, and they were very receptive. Obviously, um, you know, just talking about how the the children um, were found that they had passed on because the schools didn't treat them with dignity, and they didn't treat them with dignity because they felt they didn't have to. They felt that. Um, they needed to change the way the children behaved and the way the children looked. And they felt that they um, didn't deserve dignity because they were different. And so just trying to keep it in very simple terms, really, <laughs> that was all I, all I tried to do with Ruby's class. And they were, they were really uh, receptive. One of the children said to me, so, so my people, they're the people that came across all the boats to Canada. And I said, yes, where are your people from? <laughs> well, my dad is, uh, my dad is British and my mom is Irish. I said, oh, wow. And so when they came over, they, they agreed to share land with all of your people, right? And I said, yes, dear. And that was the, that was the, the, uh, the thinking. <laughs> and I said, in fact, you know, my people kind of showed your people the ropes. It's that they figured out how to handle all the harsh winters and all these difficult things. And uh, they did it together. And I said, and then there was this agreement to share everything. And what happens when you don't share? He said, well, people don't 
like it when you don't share. People don't get along when you don't share. I said, right. And so, you know, that's kind of where it started. People didn't want to share. And then people started not getting along. And then people started trying to figure out how they could not share some more maybe and came up with an agenda around these schools. And then one kid said to me, well, they don't, they didn't treat your, your people well in the schools. They didn't give them dignity like we receive here in our beautiful school. And I said, no, darling. So it was just really kind of trying to be honest about it. And, and I know that sounds very, you know, elementary, pardon the pun, but I, I just, uh, you know, I realized that you just have to kind of be honest and, and tell the truth and, and then always end it with a positive note saying that we learned truth from these children who have been found. These children are truth tellers and just will make all of us a little smarter. So I'll leave it at that. If I could tell a little story. Um, years ago, my, uh, my friend was here from out west and uh, my wife was uh, doing her ECE. Uh, at Cambrian College, and she, one of her assignments was, I don't know, writing a story about a family member. She wrote a story about her father. She called it Making Tracks. And it was, it was about his experience at this uh, Spanish, St. Joseph's Residential School in Spanish, Ontario. Uh, he was from Serpent River. And, uh, and, um, and so he read that story. And uh, I'm thinking that 10 plus years must have passed. And that story of his experience that my wife wrote, it must have embedded itself in his mind because he eventually, he wrote a children's book about my father-in-law's experience and it's called The Boy Who Walked Backwards. And you can find it online. It's by Ben Suris, S-U-R-E-S. -E it's a beautifully illustrated children's book. Uh, and the reason it's called The Boy Who Walked Backwards uh, ben also wrote a song um, called The Boy Who Walked Backwards Through the Snow. Uh, when he would go home from Spanish for Christmas, they were lucky. Um, he didn't want to go back. And there's a big culvert in Cutler where the train goes over. And uh, so he would walk backwards in the snow through that culvert so that it would make it look like somebody was walking out of the culvert and not walking into the culvert. And so that, uh, that book has been, uh, it's, that's the legacy of my father-in-law, really proud that uh, that beautiful book was written. And that uh, might be something that uh, the listeners might want to, uh, to check in on. The Boy Who Walked Backwards by Ben Suris, S-U-R-E-S. And, uh, and also uh, uh, a woodland uh, painting was commissioned by Ben uh, about the story, and this is the this is the um, that is the painting that symbolizes the boy who walked backwards through the snow. And Leo, my father-in-law, said they couldn't take they couldn't they couldn't beat the language out of me. They couldn't beat the language out of me. He kept his language all his life. Big witch. Dave for sharing that. Um, unfortunately, we are almost out of time. And um, so I'm not going to be able to ask any more questions. I'm sorry to those who have been waiting. Um, but, you know, maybe I don't know how the chiefs feel, but maybe we can um, contact you after the sessions with, with more of these questions. We can somehow get the answers out. Um, Alyssa, McLeod is going to do the closing and she is the newest member at Ontario Tech Indigenous Education and Cultural Services. She's my new co-worker and I just love her already. And um, I just want to um, say once again, chi miigwech to the panelists and take it away, Alyssa. Well, thank you, Jill, for that amazing introduction for the closing. <laughs> um, hello, Ani, uh, Alyssa McLeod, Indigenous, Nipissing First Nation, Donjaba. As Jill mentioned, I am the Indigenous Community Engagement Coordinator at Ontario Tech University. So I just want to thank you, thank everyone for tuning in today, but also give a big chi miigwech to all the speakers who joined us today, Chief Kelly LaRocca, Chief Dave Mowat, 
Chief Emily Wheaton and Chief uh, Grand Council Chief Reginald Nigambi, Nigambal, Oh my goodness, we all struggle with that one, sorry. Um, it was such a very informative and insightful truth that you were all sharing with us this evening. So I need to extend the, the gratitude on behalf of everyone um, behind the scenes, but also I'm sure that are tuning in as well. So thank you for your time. And thank you for sharing the experiences and the successes that exist within your communities, but also within the territories that cover Ontario and the region of Durham as well. Uh, the information that you have shared is super critical uh, in acknowledging and recognizing what is happening on Turtle Island, but also locally within this province and again within the territories we work, live and play. So thank you for your continual commitment um, to leadership, but also ensuring community voices are heard. And as uh, Chief Kelly LaRocca mentioned, being an advocate for the community, um, your work is recognized and um, very super, super thankful and grateful for all the work you do for community. So, Chini Gwech. So today we've had the honor and privilege to learn and hear about resiliency in action, driven by collective and communal values, uh, local histories and shared histories, um, but also visions and actions for the next seven generations as well. We're so fortunate to be present in this virtual space to hear and learn from the stories of identity and transformation at the personal and collective level, but also acknowledging the process and timeline involved in reaching those transformations. So thank you again for sharing. And before I proceed, I'm gonna be sharing our closing statement, but I'm also gonna share my screen, um, which directs folks to different resources for independent learning beyond today. So just bear with me, I'm gonna do that now. There we go. And if today's conversation piqued your interest, I encourage you to check out the first two that are listed there. One of them is actually a fireside chat uh, with Chief Kelly LaRocca, where she interviews a few government folks in different positions in provincial government, but also Chief Rosanne Archibald was in one of the recent interviews as well. So what I've, been, what I've put up on the screen is a link to menti.com. And later on, after I finish my closing statement, you'll have an opportunity to provide your input and your feedback for uh, the session today. So um, if you go to that website, and input the code, then you will have the opportunity to do that in just a short minute. So as we close today's session, I express and share sentiments on behalf of the collaborators who have worked so hard and um, tremendously um, behind the scenes to bring forward just phenomenal and inspirational guest speakers in hopes that these conversations will spark movement and, and spark action um, from our allies who have reached out and asked, what can you do moving forward? So the truth has been shared for many years, but also the past few months. So we encourage you to listen to that truth uh, that is being shared, and in most cases being reshared. The many challenges faced by First Nation, Métis, and Inuit communities are rooted in colonial systems and structures, such as the Indian Act. So as we are here to speak to resiliency, as we have heard, we also acknowledge and honor the strength and wisdom, the, good, the promotion of good health, Minobamanazawin, strong communal values and leadership that is evident in many First Nation, Métis, Inuit communities across Turtle Island. And with that, we encourage you to celebrate, share and amplify Indigenous joy, excellence and brilliance as much as you share the truth that exists due to colonialism as Indigenous folks in communities and nations are strong, resilient and affirming individual and collective agency. Um, with that being said, it's important to, as what's already been mentioned, go beyond social media, seek out local knowledge, seek out the truths and stories and acts of resistance that exist locally within your territory, within your region and within your municipality. There's significant and important stories and histories that shape today's relations and we can't ignore that. Conversations and actions need to extend beyond educational awareness days and it's important to be part of something that's critical and long lasting as we've heard today. And honoring that the process, or sorry, to be a strong ally, it is a process. It's a continual process of engagement, which involves actively working towards breaking down barriers and com a commitment to combating racism and discrimination and supporting others in relationships in, in which you encounter in your daily practice. And on that note, as we wrap up today's session, we now wanna take this opportunity to hear from folks tuning in today. And as I mentioned, if you go to menti.com and you put in the code 6488, you have the opportunity to share and provide your input from today. 
for um, sharing with us what your actions or individual commitments are going to be to advance reconciliation within your own life or in response to the 94 calls to action. And as folks are inputting their comments, you should be able to see them on the screen that I'm sharing with you today um, appear as folks are inputting their, their responses. And as folks are doing that, I will promote our next and final session, which is on Indigenous resurgence. So that is taking place August 19th, and we will be hearing from community members and panelists um, speaking to their individual stories of resilience, success, um, brilliance, and however that may look for them on their personal paths, uh, whether that's their career path, their personal path of revitalization, reclamation, and um, really truly sharing Indigenous success and excellence and strengths that exist within our communities. So you can register through Eventbrite. That is our final event. And without further ado, that concludes this evening's session. Thank you, everyone. And we look forward to hearing your responses and seeing them here. And if it's easier for you to pop them in the chat, by all means, you can do that. And then we can also pop it into the Mentimeter. Thank you, Miigwech, and have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Miigwech. Pomapi. Miigwech. Pomapi. 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 Miigwech. Pomapi. Miigwech. Great job, everybody. Amazing. Miigwech. Pomapi. Miigwech to the interpreters, too. <laughs>